to start. Thank you so much for the patience. It's 10 a.m. and we're joined today by our sister Thandi from South Africa, who's going to lead us through this uh, BU Powerfully talk, which is about building a career in international development. Of course, we had to start with some good vibes and put some Beyonce on because, you know, you gotta love a sister and her music. <laughs> but today, Tandi is going to take us through what, what does it take you know, as a young woman to, to define uh, a career path in international development? What are some of the studies that can be undertaken? What are some of the roads and, and path to be able to, to go through that? So without further ado, I want to welcome my sister Tandi, who's going to introduce herself and then lead us to the, through the talk. Thank you. Hi, Verlain. Um, thank you so much for this platform and good morning, afternoon and good evening to everyone um, who's joining us from around the world. Um, so I'll, I'll just jump right in. Uh, my name is Tandi Shabalala. I'm from South Africa, Johannesburg. Um, from a part of Johannesburg called Soweto. Um, you might be familiar with it. It's, it's really famous for um, the Soweto uprisings, uh, which were led by students back in 1976 against the apartheid government. Um, and they were revolting particularly against specific um, language policies towards their education. So that's where I'm from. And uh, my story basically starts in my parents' living room one day. Um, I, we were sitting uh, after watching the news after dinner and um, my parents asked me, you know, that dreaded question that every teenager is asked one, at some point in their life, um, what is it that I want to do with the rest of my life? And I just said, okay, um, well, I want to be successful. <laughs> I want to travel, you know, I want to make an impact. I want to change the world. You know, in, in my naivety, I guess, um, I, I had these, these grand ideas about what my contribution to the world could be. And my parents said, okay, so, you know, what does that look like? And at the time, um, you know, I wasn't sure, but um, I had an image of specific women in my life that I'd seen. So, for example, the, the current um, executive director of UN Women, who at the time was the deputy president of, of South Africa, Pumzile Mlambungoka, I said, well, you know, I, I want to be like her. You know, she seems like somebody who cares about issues that I care about. You know, she was doing a lot in education and development and women empowerment and, and, and so on. And, you know, my parents said, okay, and, and what else? Um, and I said, you know, what about um, Condoleezza Rice? What does she do? At the time, she was the um, US Secretary of State um, under the, the President Bush administration. And I related a lot of the time to, to her work. You know, she looked very powerful. She looked very successful. Um, and, and looking back now, I think I related to these two women, uh, firstly, because they were women, you know, um, also because they, they looked a lot like me. And they seem to have a lot of power and influence on issues that I had taken a, 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 a love to and, and, and that I had thought I would enjoy. Um, and, you know, growing up in, in Soweto um, and, you know, coming from a country like South Africa, which has a lot of potential, it's got a lot of growth, you know, it's got a lot of good things about it. We've come so far since um, 1994 and, and, you know, the anti-apartheid movement. Um, but we also have, you know, some um, issues, you know, which aren't unique to South Africa. They're global problems, essentially. But, you know, I was directly exposed to them um, being in, in, in the country. So, you know, traveled by some of these social injustices and equalities in my own country, which I asked um, of, which, which I, I recognized were also happening in the world, like, you know, inequalities, unemployment, you know, um, I, I was really concerned with the, the, the lack of women's representation in, in places of power and places of change. Um, and I started asking a lot of questions. Um, you know, and how, like, how did it get this way? What is, why, why is it like this? You know, what can we do better? Um, I also look to, you know, why, what, what is it that already exists that we can make better? You know, where do, where do all these norms come from? Where do all these laws and practices come from? Um, and how do we know, you know, and what do we do to make this better? So I asked these questions of my country, but I threw the same questions um, into the world as well. Um, and at the time, I, I didn't realize uh, that, 
you know, I, I had started my, <laughs> I like to call it a love hate relationship with, with what is, what I know today is, is policy making, um, specifically in, in, in the international affairs space. Um, so fast forward to, to that night in my parents' living room, a few years or months later, um, I had to now, you know, apply for university or college, um, and I got in. Uh, so I went to the University of Witz um, in Johannesburg, which uh, in my opinion is, is the best university in South Africa, <laughs> but others would beg to differ. Um, <laughs> But, but it is, trust me. <laughs> so at, at BITS, I, I came to learn that, you know, um, international relations, uh, and as we all know, you know, this is about relations between states, it's, it's relations between regions or bodies, you know, and it encompasses a variety of issues which um, affect us all on a daily basis, whether it's the environment, whether it's education, as I've mentioned, development, leadership, representation, history, media, communications, human rights, um, cooperations, and some of these issues <coughs> excuse me, some of these issues were actually um, some of my majors. So there was a lot of uh, cross-cutting issues which I had to contend with um, when, when I was um, at, at university. And I will say that um, my, my, when, when eventually I, I decided to apply for international relations, because I remember after we had that conversation with my parents, you know, my dad said, oh, okay, so I guess you want to go into a career of, of politics. And I, and I said, no, not really, because, you know, I, I just want to make a change, but I'm sure there's other ways of doing it, you know. Um, and I, and I recognized that when I was at WITS. Um, so I also came to learn that, you know, international relations or international affairs um, is also about policy implementation. Um, it's about policy application and development. Um, I also came to learn that, you know, it's not perfect. And some of my questions were being answered, but I didn't like the answers, you know, and this is why I got into um, international affairs or international relations or the, the policy making space um, to understand why both or how both at domestic and foreign policy levels um, and engagements, how I could uh, contribute um, to some solutions for change for some of these issues that I was concerned with. Um, and, and that's really why I'm, I'm still in the field. I, I guess I, I think I'm still relatively young in the field as well. So I have a lot to learn. Um, but I, I, I look at myself as an international affairs advocate, to, to, so to speak. Um, I encourage a lot of um, young women and, you know, with some of the, the young ladies that I mentor, um, I always, you know, try to, to let them lead, um, they, let their interests lead them into the field that they want to be in, but also giving them the, the, the heads up to say, hey, listen, things aren't perfect. You know, we come into this field thinking we're going to change the world the minute we walk in, but it's very difficult. Um, so, because of that, I also came to understand that um, <clears throat> people drive policy um, because when you look at the needs of, of, or when you look at global problems, you know, it, it has a lot to do with the needs of people. So, I, I always view my work as, you know, this being for people. Um, so, people drive policy and, and policy underpin uh, laws, norms, uh, standards, development approaches, institutions, mechanisms, um, and all of this is, is then part and parcel of state structures. Uh, and that also includes, you know, the public sector, the private sector, civil society, and there's, there's many, many stakeholders um, that, that you actually contend with. So I, throughout my studies and throughout, you know, me having this this love-hate relationship with international affairs, trying to figure out why is it that, you know, we, we have all these institutions and bodies, you know, we have the, the Southern African development community, for example, we've got the African Union, we've got BRICS, we've got ASEAN, we've got the UN, we've got the G20, the G7, we've got all these decision-making bodies and alliances um, to problems which we call global problems, um, yet we, we still don't have the answers. And at the time, it was still the, um, the, the, the Millennium Development Goals, the, the Sustainable Development Goals, which were then um, adopted in 2015, hadn't been adopted as yet. Um, so, you know, I, I went into, into this field 
as the, the sustainable development goals were then adopted, um, where I, I, I started um, in, in various organizations. So from a, a studying point of view, uh, you get somewhat of a reality check. Um, it's not easy because, you know, you have your own ideas of the world, um, but then you just have to make the decision whether you're willing to contend with that or not. Um, so that's, that's basically what my, my, my uh, educational um, experience looked like in a nutshell. So from a more practical perspective, um, because international relations or international affairs is so broad, um, I hinged every element of my experience or what I wanted to be ex my experience based on what I studied. Um, you know, so, you know, one of my first uh, jobs or internships was at a human rights organization. Um, and from there, you know, it, it not only, I may not have necessarily wanted to work just with human rights, but working in any kind of organization that has to do with the space that you're in or trying to pursue really helps because it opens up doors to other things. So I had never thought about working on issues of, of refugees or, and migration um, and international refugee law. But when I was at this human rights institution, that's the, those, were, those were some of the, the issues that I had to work with. Um, and it, I, I learned a lot about my country, I learned a lot about, you know, my continent, I learned a lot about the world and why things are the way they are, you know, and, and some of those questions that I had in my earlier life were starting to get answered. Um, so these, these different institutions that I, I was exposed to, you know, at, at that point, I was also a student who was very scared, like, you know, I, I, I was the only person really in my family who was, who was pursuing this, you know, I, I had a diverse background of professions in my family, but, you know, I didn't know where, where I would start with international affairs. Um, so I was very scared as a student, so I just jumped into every opportunity that I could get, you know. So from that human rights organizations, I, I went into different um, NGOs, um, labor organizations, you know, media organizations. I, I also got to work in the private sector, which is incredible because, you know, when you look at this field, you, you think it, it's all just, you know, politics or think tanks or NGOs, but it's not. You'll be surprised how many um, corporate firms or consultancies or bodies are actually looking for um, international relations students. Um, because they feel that we have that well-rounded view of the world. We've got a, a specific kind of um, analysis of how to, you know, apply theory or apply scenarios um, or apply situations. So I also, I also learned a lot there um, and that then opened other doors. So at that point, um, right up until I worked in, in the corporate sector, I was really just working anywhere and everywhere um, just to have something on my CV to say, hey, listen, you know, I'm not only getting my education, but I'm also trying my best um, to, to, to get um, the experience in the field, you know, and I had some of these skills that I had to offer. So that's really how you, you try and navigate in this field, because a lot of the, the questions that I do get from some of the, the young ladies that I mentor as well is, you know, how, how do I transition from being a student and getting into an institution? And I say, well, the, the good thing to do at first is to start by volunteering, you know, because that's something where you, you learn something. You may not necessarily get paid, but it's going to be valuable uh, going forward when you really start um, pursuing the more, uh, the, the bigger organizations. Um, so I also worked with think tanks and it was a really, really rich experience. And even some of the things that I learned then, I still apply now. Um, so you never lose it. So that's how you, you, you really try and craft your, your way into the field. I, in my experience, um, and, I, and I strongly uh, view that, you know, you have a level of control over how you navigate the field because you decide, okay, which way do you want to go? Because it's so broad, um, you know, and, and getting into, uh, you know, whether you're going through uh, your, your foreign ministry or your Department of International Relations, you know, you go through an application process there, whether it's at the UN or at, at the AU 
or at the G20 or at a development bank, you go through an application process there. And what these people actually look for is what you've done before. Yes, they may look at, um, you know, your education and where you studied and, you know, the subjects in which you studied, because you have to understand um, uh, have and have a, 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 a view of um, social sciences, but they also want to see where have you, what have you been exposed to. So it's it really the the responsibility really lies on you as a person. Um, it's unlike you know a, a typical job in a sense where it's like for example if you're a lawyer you know um, you go to law school um, you do articles you get into a law firm um, and of course that that's also uh, subjective it, it depends on on what kind of uh, law you want to pursue but with international relations the point I'm making is that it's less um, it's it's less certain you know I, I still know people today where um, I studied international relations with them and they're just not in the field at all. Um, some by choice and some because they didn't know where to get those opportunities. Um, because, you know, at the end of, of university, or at the end of college, it is very daunting, you know, to go out into the working world. And you kind of just take what, you, what, what you're given or you take what you, what you have. Um, so none of this happens without putting in a lot of work. That's, that's also the point I'm making. It's a lot of sacrifice as well. Um, but, you know, the, some opportunities you also create for yourself. Um, so it takes a lot of innovation as well. It takes a lot of innovation. It takes a lot of um, creativity. Um, it takes a lot of guts as well. I remember one of the, the first jobs I actually um, had, like formal paying job, um, they weren't even looking for people, you know, I, I just remember hearing about this organization from somebody who'd worked there before and I thought, oh, this would be cool, you know, um, and I kind of just wrote to them and I said, you know, I hope you'll consider me one day. And, you know, they, they actually gave me a call a few weeks later to say, hey, we're actually looking for a researcher, we're starting this new project. And that's how I got in. So sometimes you just have to take those opportunities um, and create them for yourself you know, um, and that's how you, you get into different uh, spaces because you, you also create a network. So it's not just about getting something on your CV, you create a network of people um, and institutions and places where you've worked, where you've contributed, you maintain those relations. Because if you want to get into the international affairs, uh, affairs field, it's a lot about relations. It's also about people to people relations, you know? Um, so whether you want to work for, for the ICRC um, in Geneva, or you want to work for the, for the World Bank, or you want to work for a development bank, you know, you never know how those networks can push you in that direction. Um, so you're in control of, of, of your niche, you're in control of how you want to um, pursue the, 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 the field. Um, you, you also, you know, there's a lot of issues in the world. So because international relations is so broad, the, the good part is that you're exposed to almost anything and everything. Um, the bad part is that sometimes you, you eventually want to specialize. So you have to decide how you want to, how you want to pursue that, whether you want to specialize early on or you want to be exposed to everything. So for example, you know, if, if I'm working on a project which has to do with gender representation, it may not necessarily be gender representation in political space. It could be in, in you know, the environment and, and you know, gender representation of, of female farmers or, you know, female uh, engineers in, in a different space. Um, so it, it really depends on, on where, you, where you want to go. So that's, so the list goes on and um, that's kind of how I then got into, in, into international affairs. And an important thing that you have to understand when you're in this field or when, when you're pursuing this field is how to understand and how to apply it to, you know, the common man. So I remember the one time a family member um, asked me, so what is it that you do? <laughs> and I, I couldn't say, oh, you know, Andy, I'm doing a uh, policy making. I have to explain how that applies to her, you know? So for example, you know, cancer is, is a very um, big uh, uh, disease, which affects you know, many, many South Africans. Um, it affects uh, many parts of the world as well. And what I know is that, you know, South Africa, for example, um, is, is, is one of the leading countries in, in medical isotopes. Um, and so I have to then explain to my aunt that, okay, so South Africa 
um, is plagued, for example, by you know, a disease like cancer. South Africa trades or you know, exchanges best practices or you know, does a lot of research in medical isotopes um, and how to get that, especially in, in the nuclear um, uh, space. I'm, I'm not a nuclear expert, but I know this is the one thing I, I definitely know. Um, that we, we, we do a lot, South Africa does a lot in, in, in best practices of medical isotopes. I have to explain to my aunt that because we have this relationship with the world, you know, we do a lot of research. We're able to treat our people um, with these medical isotopes. So that's it's chemotherapy or, or radio, um, um, uh, what's radio? I forgot, I forgot the term, <laughs> but whether it's chemotherapy or radiotherapy, sorry, um, that's, that's how it kind of comes down to the common man. So international affairs is on the one hand frustrating because you may not see the direct result um, of your work or of your advocacy compared to, for example, like a teacher, you know, you know that you're teaching these um, children how to read and write and one day they'll be lawyers, they'll be doctors, they'll they'll go on to be whatever they are because you have taught them how to write and you can see the direct impact. But when you're in the space, it's also about creating opportunities for, for example, the trade or the, the, the exchange and best, best practices in medical isotope research, for example. So that's, that's basically it in a nutshell. I'll, I'll leave it there and yeah, I welcome any questions. Thanks. Andy Medjoy, hi. <laughs> Thank you so hi. much. Click on my mute button, taking notes from <laughs> your <laughs> speech. So much. I think it was really, you know, powerful and not only that, you know, very informative, particularly when you explain how to transition, you know, from being a student, a student and, you know, also looking at the environment. You know, you talked about your own background and I think it's so powerful that, uh, you know, you're rising, you know, from Soweto and that now yeah. you're empowering young women all around you. Uh, I'm sure some of the, the dreamers uh, on the call have some mm -hmm. questions, so perhaps we can open the floor. Uh, if you have a, a question, please put your hand up and you can uh, unmute your mic and come directly on the, on the call. And don't be shy. All right. <laughs> Demi, do you want to come in? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Um, let me... Should I, should I use my video? Can I start my video? Okay. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sandy. I, I joined the meeting not too long ago and I have gained so much, especially on now to transition into international relations as um, a person. So my name is Dami. I'm from Nigeria. I okay. am current <laughs> I am currently um, a law student. I am looking forward to graduate next year. But what I'm doing right now is that um, I work on research for issues affecting women across Africa. I hope to one day be a part of um, a body that can influence policies to protect the rights of women and girls, not just in Nigeria, but Africa. And this class, uh, I'd like to use the word class, is uh, <laughs> a gold mine to learn on out because like you said, people make, people drive policies and a, a collaboration between the civilians and stakeholders to, to come together and see what solutions we can provide in the aspect of law. Because I believe laws, laws are very powerful. They have a way of changing our society. I'm a law student, I have seen that. So my question is, okay, you also said something about volunteering. I volunteer a lot. Most of my extracurriculars are, are focused on volunteering, which <laughs> is so good because I gain several skills now. I next year I'm going to graduate, become a lawyer, and I want to. I, I'm looking for opportunities to actually go into international relations. Let's um, start, let me use um, the African Union as an example to influence on um, the activities of member states. And how do you think I can go about that before we even talk about the big guns like the UN, the G20, the African Union? How do I go about that as a young person, as a uh, graduate? <laughs> lawyer <laughs> in the meeting. So how do you think I can do that? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Demi. Those are really good questions. Thanks. So should should I should I respond to the questions as they come or should we take a yeah. bunch and then okay. Because we don't have uh, the next question yet. 
Okay, great. Well, thank you, Demi, so much for your for your question and really congratulations on um, graduating next year. I remember that feeling the year before graduation <laughs> and thinking, where's my life going to go? <laughs> I remember saying exactly. to someone, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you, 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 you want to fulfill the potential that you see in yourself and it's not easy. Um, just, just hinging on your example about um, the, the AU, um, are you in contact or do you know of the AU office in your country or near you? Um, because that would, that would also be a really good, good point to start and, you know, send them an email uh, or, you know, go on their website, have a look at somebody you can talk to, um, give a call and say, hey, can I, can I speak to you for 15 minutes? I'm a student. I just have a few questions to ask. Um, and when you do get that opportunity, you know, just throw it out there to that person to say, hey, listen, you know, whenever you need an extra hand in research, I can come in twice a week um, to help out with that. Um, and that gives them an idea that, okay, you're a student, uh, you're willing to just, you know, work for the minimum. Unfortunately, that's just how it starts. It's never, you know, you graduate and you go straight in, in, into the big places. Um, another place to start is also um, some of the think tanks and research institutions in your, in, in your, your area or in your country. Um, mm that align to what you want to work with, you know, and if you are interested specifically in the AU, then, you know, when you're there, you can say this is the value you're going to contribute to that organization, uh, to, to that specific institute or, or organization to say, hey, listen, you want to, you know, unpack some of the laws and policies of the AU, um, say Agenda 2063 and what they're saying about women between now and then you know, um, you show them the value that you're going to add, not only what you're going to take from them. So a good start is just to establish some kind of points of contact, look at some of the think tanks and, and institutions that you have around you, um, and ask some of your, your, your lecturers as well. I, I did a lot of that. If, if they knew of any places um, where I could start, you know, whether it's once a week, I, I, I worked a lot um, while I was doing my research as well. Um, so, so that helped me a lot, you know, so you're a student um, on the one hand, but then on the one hand, you're also working and getting that experience. So establish okay. those works, do a lot of that research. It, it, it takes a lot out of you because you, like I was saying, you have to craft and, you know, dictate how your, how your journey into the field is going to go. And that really does start by creating and establishing those, those networks. Thank you very, very much. This is so helpful. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank <laughs> you for, for, for guiding Demi. The next question is from Josie. Josie, do you want to come in? Hi there. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, uh, great. Um, I'm from Oxford in the UK. Hi, Josie. Um, okay, hi. I'm 17 and I'm currently looking at universities at the moment. Um, and I'm hoping to study international relations. Um, I just had a question about your experience so far. Have you found that it's been equal in terms of like the gender balance or have you found that it's been quite difficult in like a heavily male dominated um, scene so far or have you found it in that aspect? Okay, thank you for your question. No problem. Um, thanks, Josie. Should I take the question? Should I always, are there more? Yeah, not for the moment, uh, go ahead. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you, Josie, um, and welcome to the to the discussion. Um, so, the field is generally dominated by men. It doesn't matter where you go; you can be anywhere. You know, um, when you look, for example, um, foreign ministers, female foreign ministers in the world. Um, you can count them maybe on one or two hands. It's getting better. Um, if you think of female presidents um, in the world, if you think of, of female um, directors, you know, of course, you know, the IMF had uh, Christine Lagarde, which is great. Um, but it's, it always feels like a once in a while kind of experience. Um, in my work, I have worked with, with many, many females, um, but in positions of, of influence and, powers, um, and power, there still is that slight gender balance. I know the UN has um, its gender parity strategy where they're trying to um, <clears throat> reform the UN from within the organization, not just 
as an issue which they're working on, um, but from, from their own uh, perspective as well, uh, whether it's, it's heads of um, UN country teams or special representatives of the sec uh, Secretary General, um, whether it's, it's more women um, participating in UN meetings and leading those UN meetings, there definitely is an effort um, towards trying to get that. Um, but for me, it's not just about quota. You know, you, you can't just have a space where, you know, you're just ticking the box. Do we have, you know, 15 women and, and 20 men? It's, it's, and it feels like it's, it's a genuine effort to include and increase that representation because we can't be in a world where half the half the population is 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 female, and a lot of the issues which affect us um, are, are affect us more disproportionately to men, and those decisions are made by men. So I think there is an effort uh, to, to to try and counter that um, and to work towards that as well. Um, so yeah, it's it's getting better. It's a slow process, like with any organization, whether or with any profession. You know, it's the same in 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 corporate as well. You know, they they're trying to increase the number of female CEOs. Same thing in 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 the healthcare industry, which is slightly different, but it, it's it's across the board. But from from uh, from my perspective and my experience, I have had to um, engage with a lot of women, which has been really really inspiring. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Thank you, T. Uh, the next one is Saleh. Uh, Mr. Saleh, if you want to come in. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello, yes. hi. Yes, uh, I can hear you. Hi. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hello, hello. My name is Paul. Yes, I am from Sudan. Right now, I live in Lebanon. Just I wanna have uh, ask you. Uh, in Lebanon, we we come from Africa, and uh, lady come from Africa work domestic worker in Lebanon, and uh, face with many problems, and we we can't we can't get the solution. Uh, sorry, first of all, my language is very, uh, very bad because <laughs> my first okay. language is Arabic. Uh, <laughs> but uh, how, how we can together get solution for domestic worker? I live uh, in Lebanon uh, ten years ago, and I see a uh, lady from Africa face with, uh, you know, uh, sexual and killed and. And Lebanon people uh, don't give salary and work uh, 20 hours in the day, and they they don't have uh, uh, off day, and they, they have a very 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 problem. And I ask you how we can together get solution for the domestic worker come from Africa. Okay, Do thank you so much. Understand me? Oh, mm -hmm. understand me? This is my question. Thank you so much, Saleh. Okay, welcome. <laughs> okay. Can I jump right in? Yes, yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Saleh, for your question. So just to clarify um, what your question is, you, you're saying how to get um, solutions for domestic workers in, in, in Africa? Yes. Okay. Um, so that, that really starts with, you know, the country concerned. Um, one of the, the, the main issues or one of the main um, ideals of, of international affairs is that, you know, countries have to decide on their own issues. Um, however, there is the a body such as um, you know the International Labour Organization, which deals with international labour standards and international labour norms and policies. So one way of of doing that, you know, from uh, for example, from a civil society perspective, is you know lobbying your government to make sure that they're meeting some of these standards. For example, of the International uh, Labour Organization. I'm I'm not an expert on labour, but there should, there should be some kind of modalities or, or, or research or norms um, that uh, govern uh, some of the working conditions 
of, of different um, kinds of workers at, at all levels. So a good way to start would be to find out if you know the country concerned is in line with some of those with some of those standards, um, look at the laws of that specific country and see you know who's breaking the law because that that's also where it starts and holding those people accountable um, and looking at some of the accountability mechanisms and institutions that are available um, in your country to kind of direct those queries. You know if that doesn't work um, from a legal perspective, then you you know you take it up a notch and and you you lobby your government. Um, from a civil society perspective, you engage them. Um, you know, one of the, the main things of international affairs is engagement. You know, you, you, you don't want to just go off and, and do your own thing without engaging and actually finding out maybe the government is trying to do something. It's just that implementation, like I was saying earlier when I was speaking, implementation isn't always perfect. Um, a policy or a law may be there, but implementing that could be an entirely different story. So lobbying the government, engaging them, um, lobbying um, and finding out some of the laws that are available to protect some of these uh, domestic workers and then taking it up a notch again and finding out in terms of international standards, do they meet those standards? Um, so that's a really um, good place to start um, and ensuring that in, in ensuring that, you know, there is more protection given uh, to domestic workers, you've done all, all the research, you know, and then from then on, you can put them in, in that place where you, where you can say, okay, you guys will be protected according to these laws, according to these practices, or according to, to, to these standards. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, me? Uh. Uh, okay, uh, I, 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 I have a, a suggestion. Just I want someone to uh, support me mm -hmm. and, and I talk with, uh, with the African Union, with, uh, with the, the, we take an uh, opportunity and we go. Right now we, we work in organization MCC. This organization uh, is uh, uh, okay, sorry. This organization he he, he important with the human rights for lady from Africa here. We work together, and, and I want someone help me. And I talk this this problem in the African Union, and then we we go in the in the inside country, any country in Africa like Ethiopia, Nigeria, Ghana. There is too much domestic worker come from uh, that country and work here, mm -hmm. and that's uh, many problems. Sale. You know? and, and I wanted someone help me. Sale. Shukran Jazilan. Um, perhaps what we can do is have a bilateral talk, and we, the team can reach out to you. So because the talk is unfortunately only one hour, and we want to make sure that. Okay. All the on the call can can have a discussion on building a career in international relations but shukran jazilan for for sharing your very important point and and the team will reach out to you and see how we can you know discuss shukran lelo okay okay Lelo, do you want to come in? Hello. Hi. Hi, my name is Little Honolo Mugotevi. I actually got your contacts through Mimi or Mabato that you went to university with. And I actually, yeah, then I started following you on Instagram and I found out about this talk. <laughs> so um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, I recently started studying international relations after having a big interest in it from my travels. And that's when I started studying through UNISA because I was already working and I couldn't study part time. And during that time, um, I wanted to, even though I was studying, I still wanted to start the career while I was studying because I always think it's a good idea to at least try to put your foot in the door before you graduate. Mm -hmm. Mm. So I've been applying, so my degree is in graphic design, which is completely unrelated. 
And, but I'm right now working as a researcher for a Japanese newspaper. So I thought this is a fantastic way to at least start getting my foot in the door. But what I've realized is that every time I try to network and I try to speak to people, especially at events, because especially as a researcher, you get the opportunity to attend a lot of events and you meet a lot of people from big organizations that as a female, you're not really taken seriously. And some guys, um, you give people your business cards and instead of them wanting to talk about work, they want to take you out for dinner or for drinks. And I feel like that's a huge barrier that I continuously keep um, bumping into. And I, it's, I find it extremely frustrating because I'm always around. I, I try to put myself in the right positions, you know, like I go to events, I make the efforts, I try to network, I try to put myself out there. But every time I do that, like you said earlier, a lot of people in positions are men. And as a young female, they're just like, oh, this pretty girl, let me take her out for dinner. And then it's, it's very frustrating and I don't know how to get over that barrier. And my second question is that I know four girls, South African as well, um, who did um, study international relations. Two of them have a honors and two of them have a master's. And all of them have struggled to get their foot in the door in any organization, which I find extreme, it's almost mind boggling to me. It's like, especially now in the time when they're trying to empower black women in South Africa, that this continuously happens. So I just wanna know how to break that ceiling, that glass ceiling, because both glass ceilings, because I'm just like, I'm trying to put myself in the right place, but nothing is happening. Okay, thank you so, thank you so much for that question. That's so hard not. Um, yes. Okay, so I'll, I'll sure no problem. I'll take your question. So you know you you'll be surprised um, how how much your 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 degree or your your experience will matter in the future. Um, you know it, it right now it may seem like what you need is just an international relations degree and that's that and of course that's important. Um, that's I guess the shortcuts or the easier way to get in. But um, just just in terms of don't worry too much about that. Do as much as you can to, you know, to get your studies. Um, you know, it's, it's, it, get, get your studies, um, try and get that experience. And, you know, if you're having these issues with, with men, then reach out to specific organizations that you are um, interested in. You know, uh, you're interested in these organizations and reach out to women. You know, if you have to completely uh, avoid that for now, because you will, probably contend with that in the future. If you have to avoid that for now, then reach out to women and say, hey, you know, like what I was saying to, to, to Demi earlier, you know, you give these people a call and you say, hi, can I have a chat with you? Can we schedule a chat for, you know, 15 minutes on a certain day? Um, I, I just want to get to know the work of your organization. I'm really interested. This is what I've been exposed to, you know, and you speak to employers as well. Um, you said you, you, you intern at a, or you work for, for a Japanese newspaper. Ask them to, to take you along to some of these events, um, you know, create these networks. And, and I know you, you probably already have, but there's never enough networking. I went to a lot of events throughout my studies and even after that, um, you know, and it's never easy, but there will be that one um, organization that is looking for, for somebody, um, you know, maybe also start like looking at think tanks and, and go and volunteer there and say, hey, listen, this is your experience and these are some of the, 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 the this is some of the value you can add and this is how you can contribute even as a, as a graphic designer because I'm sure there's a lot more to graphic design than just, you know, just uh, what, what people understand it to be. Um, and on, on top of that, uh, you know, your, your friends with masters in the field, this is also a really, really, really incredibly competitive field. Um, I, th I think your friends should also um, do, you know, as I was saying, reach out to some of these organizations as well, even on a volunteer basis. You know, um, it doesn't matter where they're working now. Um, you know, I, I assume it's in corporate or NGOs. Um, you'll be surprised how many um, organizations look for researchers, you know, in the social sciences, you know, go back to, to the university or where you studied and say, hey, what is it that you can do? How is it that you can contribute um, and, and help them 
in, in that field because what one of the things I also did um, when I was studying, I also um, tutored, you know, I, I, I taught um, third year, second years, first years, that also helped me a lot because then I could demonstrate my understanding of the field as well. Um, so, you know, wherever women go, unfortunately, there is a glass ceiling, but it's also about creating those opportunities for yourself to get through that, you know, and with, with any career, um, especially in international affairs as well, there is a very difficult teething stage. It's, it's not easy, um, but, but you will get there and, you know, reach out to your, to, to your friends who, who are in the field. Um, if you know anybody who is in the field and if not still reach out to the big organizations as well there will be somebody who will answer your call um, who will respond to your email who will give you a, a, a way to to get in or who will give you some piece of advice where you know which you you didn't know before um, and there's a lot of portals as well um, you know there's there's un volunteers there's au volunteers um, there's there's different there's there's a variety of different um, think tanks which have like a, a youth wing or a volunteer um, uh, element you know that's something you can also do um, so like I was saying for now it always starts off very very rough but at some point as you as you as you move into the field and as you move into the sector um, you will find that opportunities will open a little bit more with um, the, the, the the experience that you that you get. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tate. So it's a very uh, engaging conversation and a lot is coming out. Uh, the next uh, to, to have a question is our sister Zaid. Zaid, do you want to come in? But just a quick one, my sisters. You know, I, I think we're discussing that yesterday, Tandi. You know, it's beautiful and we get so much information. Unfortunately, the talk is only one hour and we only have 15 minutes left. Unless everyone is okay to stay slightly a bit longer to, to finish the Q&A. Uh, we have uh, we have five sisters on on the queue to 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 come in. So, do you want to take all the five questions at one and then answer, or do you want to continue going one by one? Um, whatever is easiest. I, I yeah, I can I can take them all. <laughs> okay, okay. Zay, do you want to come in and then it's followed by Situ, Juliana, Boy Pillow, and I think Irene, you had a, you also had some thoughts to share. Thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, I did international relations, but then I thought that I could be an ambassador or work at the embassy. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I finished school, I stayed home for like five months without job. And then I thought I could start something by empowering women and girls. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I started and uh, whenever I apply for a job or I see some opportunities, they want someone with more experience, like five years experience, 10 years experience. And I guess that is the barrier for me. Yeah. And my question is now, how, how could you get there and the companies or the organization want someone who, are, who is experienced? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's a really good question. Thank you. Hello? Is there another question? Yes, we have our sister Setu. Setu, do you want to come in? I think your mic is, uh, is muted. Okay. Okay, it doesn't seem to be going. Perhaps we can go to our, to our sister. Juliana, do you want to come in? Juliana was next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right. Um, thank you, Tandy, for the talk. Well, I actually want to get into international relations too. I'm still 19 and I'm thinking of doing something related to that. So currently I have been volunteering and had internships with some international non-governmental organizations dealing with this whole social injustice issues, right? But then I'm worried that later on, if I then get into the field, my age may limit me from making effective contributions quickly, that is. So has your age limited you from getting certain opportunities within this international relations sector? 
Okay, <laughs> that's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Our next sister to come in is Boy Pillow. Do you want to come in? <laughs> Sure thing. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tandy. Hi, we below. <laughs> Thanks so much for your incredible presentation. You've got an amazing story. Um, and just a small shout out to everyone. Tandy actually tutored me in my <laughs> honors year while I studied international relations. <laughs> um, so my question relates to um, my career after studying international relations. So I took a completely different route. I went into communications and marketing and now digital communications. Um, so now given this turn of, you know, a career and um, thinking about coming back into international relations, but more filling the gap of digital and communications and digital, especially with international relations, because there's so much that happens in these organizations, but none of it gets really seen by, you know, a lot of people who are concerned or are interested, especially on like um, social media platforms and where, you know, we are all on, but you never get to really see what is happening um, in the AU, not even from a deep policy level, but even just from a, a social level to understand how the organization works, some of the events that they host. So how would you kind of, advise someone like me who would want to take that 360 to go back into international relations but still trying to maintain um that digital communications and marketing connect i know it's quite it's a bit technical but you know just kind of bringing ir and digital together okay thanks Great. thank you thank you so much that was a really good question as well yeah Thank you, dear. The, the next uh, one, uh, Irene, I think you had a comment or a question. Do you want to come in? Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share some thoughts. Uh, first of all, thank you so much, Verlen, for organizing uh, this great discussion and to Tandy um, for uh, her great experience for sharing what was her path. Um, I just wanted to say that from my experience, um, international affairs is a very competitive field. That's what, what has been um, my experience so far. Uh, for instance, uh, I struggle a lot. I, I have an LLB and an LLM, so I studied law and since I was um, 23, uh, I knew that my dream was um, working in the international law uh, field and especially for the UN but <laughs> before I got there um, I had to struggle quite a lot uh, I even had to take on three internships unpaid so that was over a year working for free which um, I agree that is is very important because especially when you don't have experience it's important that you learn as much as you can and it's also a very good opportunity to um, expand your network and get to know people and you never know what door will open up afterwards but yeah um it was it was very frustrating at some point and i remember even last year i was again looking for a job and i had to send over 80 applications before i even got an answer and uh, an invitation for an interview um, so yeah i just would like to say to everyone who is listening and still studying that um, it's very hard and don't give up because eventually something will will open for you like you will find a job that that really um, fulfills you but yeah it's very hard so be ready for hard times if they come that was that was just a contribution from my side thank you so much Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it's I, I completely relate to 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 what you're saying. And when when I started, like I was saying, a lot of my I think it was only like my fourth internship or, or job where I, I I got paid, you know. But before that, you you kind of just have to struggle through to get that experience um, and to build those networks as well. Thank you so much. Perhaps, T, before you can start answering the question, the next uh, and, and last question for this uh, 
for this uh, for this one, and then we can go back to the question is uh, from uh, Gladys. Gladys, you want to come in? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Verlin. Thank you so much, Tandy, for your presentation. I'm going to make it quick so that you can answer to all the questions. I wanted to know um, from, from your presentation, which experience uh, has been the most fulfilling for you so far? If you could just share with us, um, yes, which experience, how it happened, why, why it was great, what that would be nice. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so that was all the questions. Actually, we have one that just came from our sister Toyin. Perhaps Toyin come in, and then we can and we can go through the the answers. Thank you, dear. Okay. All right. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Um, well, it's it's afternoon here. Good afternoon from Nigeria. Um, <laughs> that was a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it every bit of it. Yes, my question is this. Um, I studied communication and language arts, and I also had a master's in theater arts. Uh, I'm a brick as journalist. But um, I've always been passionate about issues that concern young people, women and girls. And uh, for, for the past eight years, I've actually been involved in different uh, media advocacy uh, for this set of people. And recently have been, well, thinking of going for another, perhaps a master's in gender studies, because I feel like, um, I feel a little bit um, not being an authority when it comes to issues that affect women and girls. So I wanna ask, is there a relation between international relations and gender studies? And if you would advise, uh, would you say I should continue to set for or go back to your master's in gender studies as a well? Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Okay. So is that are those all the questions? That's it. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, great. Okay, so I'll, I'll go back to the beginning. Um, to Zatuna's question, um, so you, you, you said that um, you experienced a lot of barriers um, with finding a job and you stayed home for five months um, because they want a lot of experience from you. You know, what, what I learned is that sometimes you really have to uh, start with the smaller roles. Um, and even if those roles are not necessarily something that you want to do um, or you feel that you can do more and you can contribute more, there, there's always something to learn in, in a smaller role that they may offer you, you know, because you may be applying for something which requires somebody with a little bit more experience and a little bit more skills because that issue is very technical or there's a lot of responsibility. Not to say that you wouldn't be able to take on that responsibility, um, but this be, because it's such a, a really, really competitive um, uh, sphere, it's also a very um, technical sphere in a lot of uh, ways because it, it does have a lot to do with policy making and implementation. You have to have um, a lot of experience to understand how, how certain things work and if the organization feels that you don't have that as yet, then maybe, you know, going back to the drawing board and starting really, really small could be something that could help you then gain your experience. Whether you're working for a, a small NGO with, which deals with youth and education and development or health, that's always a, a good way to start. Um, whether you're, you're volunteering, whether you're, you're, you're doing a, a little bit of everything. Some, at some point, that experience will come full circle. It will come together. I never thought that, you know, working with uh, refugees and migration at some point would be something that still applies to me today. You know, um, it's, it, it's not an issue that I, I'm entirely focused on and I didn't really focus on um, in, a, in trying to craft my career, but it's still something that is important to my understanding. So maybe starting um, in, in smaller spaces and smaller organizations, um, which are aligned to what it is that you want to do is also a good place to start. And you'll see some of those barriers starting to come down. Um, so, so I hope that helps. Um, so uh, Juliana's 
uh, question had to do with um, age limiting me. No, actually age has been on my side. I have found that historically uh, in, in all the teams that I've worked with, I've been the youngest. Um, you know, sometimes it's a management style. Some managers, you know, young people may be viewed as, oh, you don't really know much or, oh, you don't have enough experience or, oh, you're still coming in with a very uh, naive way of looking um, you know, at the world, but it's your responsibility, like I was saying earlier, to really change that and say, no, well, you know, young people are actually game changers. You know, we, we are agents of transformation. I have something to say, you know, and you, you then own that space as well. And you'll see more and more people, you know, bringing you along uh, with their teams and having ideas and also pitching your ideas and saying, hey, listen, I know we're working on a project with, you know, women, in infrastructure or, or you know women in health or or, or youth or, or whatever issue that you're looking at you can then say hey I've got an idea what do you think there will always be at least one or two people in which you trust in the organization that you can bounce your ideas off um, and you know if it's adding value uh, to the organization and it'll also increase the name and status of that specific organization then you know a lot of the time you'll see some of your ideas being infused it does doesn't always work it's not always perfect I think for the longest time when I got into the field I felt like I didn't have a voice um, and you know I felt like okay all I have to do my duty is just to be a sponge and you know it'll humble you as well so a lot of the time you have to just take it all in but put in that work because you know somebody will remember you that you know oh you're a hard worker do you want to jump into this meeting you know whether it is you're writing minutes or you're chairing the meeting it doesn't matter because you will learn something you will take something out um, and engaging within your organization will also help so i in my experience have found that um <clears throat> being young or the youngest um, has actually also been on my side. And what is also on your side is, is your vision, right? You say, well, you know, I'm 19 right now. In the next 10 years, this is what I envision I want to do. You know, and if you get to an organization where you feel like, oh, I can stay here for the next five years, then that's when you, you, you push and, you know, you work hard and, and you make yourself heard. You know, um, a lot of the perceptions are that, oh, you know, young people, they, they don't know where they're going or what they're doing. But um, in this field as well, it's starting to change where, you know, young people are part of, you know, the change. You know, they, they are agents of, of transformation. You know, they can contribute to that voice and different perspectives. What we have on our side is that, you know, we, we are coming from a different generation. The, the problems that we're facing today, we have particular kind of solutions to them um, so you need to trust that um, you need to take responsibility and you also just need to own um, where it is that you are and don't worry too much about your age of course um, you will always uh, have to contend with that challenge but it's something that you you can and you will overcome over time um, great so the next question was from Boybilla on uh, transitioning from digital communications to international relations now one of one of my my majors was actually media and communications um i went from doing you know graduate studies in media and communications into um international relations and my research had to do a lot with international relations and that's why um at the university when i pitched i actually said well you know because a lot of people didn't understand well how do you do media and communicate i mean um and international relations and i had to say well who's who's telling us who's who's telling us how we're implementing those policies you know i remember saying that to to my lecturer and he said okay we can pitch it to to you know the heads of school and all of that and we'll see how it goes um and and in that way i had to then you know actually write my proposal before the proposal was even uh, required before I got in because I had to show that you know there is a connection and a relevance between the two so right now for example um, with the coronavirus we're all doing this digitally and one of the issues that um, we, we, we were discussing in another meeting um, at work was that uh, you know a lot of women now are able to participate for example in negotiations or in discussions in in and they're, they're from remote areas you know so what what the coronavirus has exposed for example is 
the digital divide, but it's also um, exposed the power of technology to bring more people together. So you can definitely keep that digital communications experience. Um, and it sounds like you, you want to stay in that, but just be in the field, then you, you need to decide how it is or what it is that you're, you're interested in. If, you, if you're wanting to work for the AU, for example, for their um, environment and climate department, um, and you want to um, you know, be the person who's you know, either the spokesperson or marketing some of these issues, then you absolutely can, because what they'd be looking for is somebody who's more, uh, who has an idea of branding or marketing or communications or how to get the messages there than somebody who's just, uh, you know, ju just uh, an environmentalist, because you, you can be an environmentalist or a scientist or somebody who, who knows how to articulate those policies, but it's, it's another thing to be able to communicate those policies. Of course, you have to have an understanding of um, that specific field or subject matter, um, but it's, it's definitely, definitely doable. Um, and also when you do start transitioning and for example, if you're applying to a specific organization, uh, what you do is you craft your, your pitch or your interview or your CV or your experience in a way that fits that organization. Um, so not necessarily to say you're taking away from all the other experience that you have, but you have to show them how you bring that value as well. Um, so it, it definitely is possible. I think it is. Um, and it's been done before. Um, okay, and then the other question, oh, then it was Irene's, Irene's comments on, on a competitive field. Um, just to also say that, Irene, I really um, relate with you. Uh, you know, for a long time, I just did everything and anything that I could get my hands on. Um, you know, I was, I was a little bit of that annoying student who would have, to, who'd ask my lecturers, so do you know any way where I can work, even if it's once a week, you know? Um, and you get answers to those questions and you know eventually as you keep trying and you keep going the opportunities do come somebody does remember you so it does take a lot out of you it it is a, a lot of sacrifice but you have to keep going you know um and this is something that i that i tell some of the the young ladies that i mentor as well in their anxiety to say not you know for example uh you know christine lagarde for example or uh, who, whoever it is at the helm of, of an organization didn't, you know, get to where they are just by, you know, waking up and getting a job. It took a lot of hard work as well. So, you know, unfortunately, we all have to go through that. It's difficult. It's hard, but, but you will we'll definitely get there. Um, and Gladys, you had asked about my, my most fulfilling <laughs> experience. So last year, um, I'll, I'll try to keep this very short. Last year, um, you know, so this year is the anniversary of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Um, and basically what that is, it's a recognition of the role of women in peace and, and security contexts, um, whether it's in conflict or post-conflict situations. Um, so basically this agenda was adopted or recognized through a UN Security Council resolution, which is a, it's an international policy document in the year 2000. So in 2020, it's, a, um, it's, it's the anniversary. So last year, I was part of the team that actually negotiated the 10th um, resolution or uh, document, which then um, basically said, you know, what we need to do is focus on implementing some of the, the, the recommendations and, and lessons learned of the past experiences. Um, you know, there are still gaps in, in, in recognizing women's uh, participation, uh, representation, whether it's in uh, peace building across different contexts, whether it's in representation, um, we, we still need to do more. So I was part of that negotiating team um, and it was incredible because the, 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 the UN Security Council adopted that um, and it was unanimously adopted, meaning all countries agreed to it. So getting to, getting to an agreement at the UN, is, it's, it's a big deal because it, it happens a lot on different issues, but on this issue, it's, it's, it was incredibly difficult because different countries have different perspectives about how women should be part of different uh, processes. So basically what I was part of, I was part of forming a consensus. I was part of forming a, an international standard. I was part of forming an international norm, which 
today, it will forever be in, in the history books. And, and that's something I really, really carry with pride. It took a lot out of me. I slept for, for two weeks after that, um, but, but it, was, it was really, really worth it. So, so that's one of my, my most um, incredible experiences. And um, yeah, and I finally um, also met a few uh, female presidents and female ambassadors that I'd always um, kind of, uh, you know, uh, looked up to. Um, you see them at the UN and, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's very strange because you're like, oh my gosh, that's her, you know, and you have to calm down. But yeah, so those, those are some of my, my, my highlights. Um, and then Toyin, you had a question about whether to, to do your um, MA in gender studies. Absolutely. Um, there is a whole, you know, there's, there's you and women. That is a body just dedicated to women's issues um, across the board. You know, it's not, like I was saying, it's not just in representation. I, I made that example because that's what I'm passionate about and that's, that's what I, I, I do. Um, but you should absolutely do um, gender studies internationally. I mean, gender studies is definitely part of, um, you know, uh, uh, part of international relations. Um, it, it applies in everything, in, in development policy. You know, how are we, how are we ensuring and tailoring um, specific um, ideas or, or mechanisms to empower women. Uh, SDG 5, for example, speaks on, on, on gender equality. Um, SDG 1 speaks on poverty. I think it's 4 that speaks on education. If you look at um, SDG 4, for example, I'm just making an example of how you can apply yourself. Um, that speaks on, on, on education um, and how you can apply your gender studies in the field for example, one of the biggest problems right now, I mean, half of the world's population is women um, and girls, but some of those girls are unable to go to school um, when they have, for example, their monthly period. So it would be absolutely be incredible for you to be able to be part of that because you come with a specific um, idea um, of how to make better their access to, for example, um, hygiene facilities, um, sanitary towels and, and all of that because then when you contribute to making those standards or those norms um, and working with those organizations that then help access for young girls to go to school during that time then you know you contribute for example to SDG4 which speaks on you know girls going to school so it's not just about going to school and reading a book and knowing how to write, but it's also about creating conditions which will enable young girls to go to school. So that's just a practical example of how you can apply your, your gender studies in international relations because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all part of it as well. And it also depends what you want to do with, with, with um, your gender studies uh, um, uh, uh, masters, you know, right now, for example, a country like Sweden, their foreign policy, they, it's called a feminist foreign policy, which means there's a specific lens in which they, um, in which they view the world. And that's a, that's a feminist lens and that that's a gender lens, meaning when they look at their domestic needs and they flip that outside into the world, they make sure that whatever they negotiate or whatever they, their, their international engagements that they engage in also speak to a specific gendered uh, approach to how they will resolve their problems. So your, your gender studies um, uh, masters would be, would be valuable. You know, that's, that's something I would, I would absolutely encourage. Um, so yeah, I think that was all the questions. Okay, thank you so much. That was so comprehensive and powerful, you know, going through the details and uh, a lot of comments in the chat box from our sisters are uh, just so grateful for all the work and experience you've shared. I think we've, uh, I've taken a lot of notes. I heard someone said that it was a class <laughs> and I agree that it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's almost, a, it's, it's not almost, it's a master class, you know, and being able to, to receive a lot of your own experience as a young woman working in international relations and, you know, I think Irene mentioned it and, and you built on it, how difficult, you know, it, it can be to, to be able to access the space. And then once you access the space, to be able to just be you, you know, and, and to bring some of your uh, thoughts and, and dreams into, into policymaking and uh, actually action, also implementation. 
my dear sisters, it's always like this moment, the end of the <laughs> powerfully talk, and we don't want to let go. Uh, yes, we're, we're past 11, unfortunately, but I think uh, I'll leave you the last for attendee before we go, but I just want to, to wrap up and, and say thank you to everyone for, for coming in, all our sisters, uh, sisters beyond countries, beyond any boundaries that blind us, because in reality, as we know, and as we've seen, uh, today, Tandi was able to, to connect with our sisters, uh, Iran, with our sisters, uh, everyone, you know, uh, all the barriers that we see are just, um, you know, they, they don't exist. It's all within us. And being able to, to connect and have some of the, of the thoughts you, you shared, particularly when it comes to building on innovation. I took notes on <laughs> when it comes to innovation, to creativity, to, to, to believe in, in yourself and, and, you know, taking, you know, the power from from your guts and I, I like also what Iren said, you know, that it's hard but don't give up. You know, you have to be you have to be a hustler, unfortunately, if I may say that like that. But that's also the reason why uh, we came together, all of us, everyone even on this talk, to, to be able to build this space with Zara Stream, you know, and I think I shared a bit on the website, this constant struggling and this constant hustling, working two or three jobs, internships, and, and never seeing the end. And also this very negative, patriarchal competition, you know, believing that, oh, if I'm well with my sister, if I pull her up or then I'm falling down and and that's not you know we we all rise together and once we understand that that one hand washes the other have you ever tried to wash a hand with, with only one hand <laughs> difficult so yeah exactly <laughs> the struggle is even more so I, I really believe in that in in, in the power of, of solidarity but most importantly of love you know I think this is once we can find within ourselves and and center and tap into love and light all the rest, you know, there, there might be insurmountable mountains and, and, you know, through through the history, for instance, of South Africa, we learn a lot. But as Nelson Mandela said, you know, it's difficult to get to the top of the mountain. Then you realize the other mountains you have to go through. But if you have your companions, if you have your sisters around, the, the, the walk will be much easier. You don't have to go to the top of the mountain alone. You can actually go together. So I think those are the last words I'd like to give. And I'm going to leave the floor to Sister Tandy, who's going to give the last words before, before we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Berlin, for this uh, platform. It was incredible um, to talk about, you know, what I what I do, what I love, you know, um, and just always advocating for women to continue to get into the space. Um, it's not easy. It'll never be easy um, because that's unfortunately how things are, and we've inherited that. Um, but you know, it's 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 in the world's interest. Um, to include us wherever it is that we want to be, you know. So I encourage you to whatever you do, you know, take up those opportunities, use those opportunities, you know, um, push yourself into these places um, because, you know, we, we, we can't be ignored as women. Um, like I was saying, we make up half the world's population. There's no way, you know, things will remain like this forever with the inequalities and some of the biases. And, you know, somebody shared an experience of, you know, men just wanting to take her out. Um, it won't always be like that, but it's also up to us to take on that responsibility and to really just go into the field um, and, 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 and go forward. So with that, um, good luck to everyone. Um, all the best with, with your endeavors um, into the future. And yeah, it'll, it'll work out. It's, it's not easy. And even being in the field, I think that's something I neglected to say, even being in the field, it's not always um, easy. Uh, but, you know, you in, in fulfilling what it is that you love, you know, it's, it's worth it. It's a worthy um, pursuit um, of, of your life's passions and of your life's purposes. Thank you. That's <laughs> powerful. Thank you so much. And perhaps if sisters want to unmute and say thank you too, and then we can, it's always difficult. I don't like to say goodbye, so I will leave it at that. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.